Heist de Young is Associate Professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. He received his PhD from the University of Wisconsin in 2001. Following postdoctoral appointments at UC Santa Cruz and the University of Maryland, he was appointed to the faculty at Penn State in 2005, and he moved to Michigan State, thanks to our recruitment efforts, uh, in 2014. His research is focused on neutrino and gamma ray astrophysics, for which he received a Faculty Early Career Development Award from the National Science Foundation. He is presently the deputy spokesperson of the Ice Cube collaboration, which you'll hear more about in just a moment. He's also interested in the application of new research-based teaching methods to introductory physics courses. Thank you very much. Um, trustees, President Simon, thank you for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about the research that I'm involved in. Uh, I work on the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory down at the South Pole. Uh, this is a, a picture here of the, uh, the electronics building that uh, reads out our detector. So Ice Cube is a large collaboration. There's about 300 physicists from four, these 44 institutions around the uh, world, mostly in the U.S. and in Europe, and including Michigan State for the last half year or so. Uh, I realize that some of you may not be professional particle physicists, so let me tell you just a little bit about uh, what neutrinos are. Uh, you see here a table of the uh, fundamental particles that make up all of the matter and control all of the forces that we know about. You see the electrons and the up and down quarks that uh, make up uh, protons and neutrons. You also see th these three uh, neutrinos here. Uh, which are very strange particles. They're very unlike every other particle we know. They're at least a, a million times lighter than all of the other particles. We don't actually know how light they are because we haven't been able to measure masses that small yet. Uh, they barely interact with other matter, so they're sometimes called ghost particles. Uh, they'll pass straight through the Earth, through the uh, Sun. There are several hundred billion of them passing through each of us here as we sit every second. And over the course of your lifetime, one of them may interact with some matter in your body. Uh, they also oscillate between the three different types. So a neutrino that starts out as an electron neutrino may spontaneously turn into an electron or a tau neutrino. In all of these ways, they're very unlike all of the other particles we know about. And so learning more about them is one of the fundamental uh, questions in particle physics today. So the, the fact that these are such uh, antisocial particles that don't like to interact means that you need a very, very big target and a lot of patience if you want to uh, have a chance at seeing any of them. And because we're kind of short on patience, we decided to build the biggest target we could. Uh, we went down to the South Pole where there's a very transparent ice cap, uh, uh, more than a mile and a half thick. And so we monitor a billion tons of the uh, ice under the South Pole looking for faint flashes of light that are produced when neutrinos interact in the ice. Now, the South Pole, we went there because of the unique uh, environmental conditions, but it is uh, an interesting place to try to do scientific work. The weather isn't always as uh, conducive as one might like. You have to get there on a, a military cargo aircraft, um, and believe me, if you think flying coach is painful, uh, this is a new experience. Uh, what we have to do to sink our instrumentation down into the ice is to melt a hole uh, about two feet across and about a mile and a half down uh, and throw our instrumentation, well, very carefully lower, excuse me, <laughs> our instrumentation down the hole quickly before the ice refreezes. Uh, you can see here some of the instrumentation, some of the activities at the South Pole. So uh, <coughs> once we've got our instrumentation in the ice, then we see flashes from neutrinos that look something like this. Uh, the faint black dots that you can sort of see there are the sensors that we have, and the colored dots are sensors which detected light over this course of a few millionths of a second. The size of the colored dot indicates how much light was detected, and the color indicates the time at which it was detected, starting at red and running through orange and yellow to green. And so what you see here is an invisible uh, particle that doesn't, uh, isn't detected by any of our sensors entering from the right, uh, interacting with a proton somewhere near the middle of our detector, and producing a uh, spray of particles which uh, traveled through hundreds of, me hundreds of meters of the ice and exited <coughs> our detector on the left. Uh, it's a little bit hard, even for someone like me that's been working on this detector for uh, a few more years than I'd care to think about, uh, to envision just how big these events are. So what I've done is I've taken one of these displays of our events and I've overlaid it on the campus. Uh, so you can see that these uh, events, our detector, uh, 
recording these events is, is really giant in scale. We're detecting light from these uh, subatomic particles at distances of hundreds of meters through solid ice. Uh, in fact, the, this event was roughly as bright as one of the, the lights at Spartan Stadium, although only for a few billionths of a second. So there's a lot of science uh, that we do with Ice Cube, and I'm not going to have time to tell you much about it, but I'd be happy to answer questions afterwards. Uh, we ask questions like, why do neutrinos, why are they the way they are? How do they behave? Uh, why are they so different from all of the other particles we know about? What is the dark matter that makes up uh, about a quarter of the universe, about five times as much uh, of the mass of the universe as all the stars and galaxies and dust and things we know about? Uh, and also, what's happening in these incredibly energetic systems colliding neutron stars and supermassive black holes which are eating their host galaxies and somehow producing cosmic rays that are bombarding the Earth constantly? So these are the sorts of questions we ask over the last few years. Uh, there's been a lot of interest in the answers we're coming up with, uh, including both the, the scientific press and uh, the popular press. So uh, let me tell you just a little bit about where things stand. Um, we were very pleased to complete our detector just a few years ago in 2010. Uh, it was a $300 million uh, construction project almost. Uh, seven years in the making and completed on time and on budget, working just exactly as we designed it to, in fact even better than we anticipated. We're already producing important results. And in fact, we're so encouraged by what we've come up with that we're planning a major new expansion of the detector uh, called Ice Cube Gen 2. Uh, that's a pun on the name of a species of penguin because that's the sort of sense of humor we have in particle physics. Uh, anyway, I'm very pleased to be here at Michigan State. We're gearing up to play a, a major role in this new effort. And I think I'd like to close by just mentioning the names of some of the other people at MSU who are involved in this uh, project. So thank you very much for your attention. Questions or comments? Is there a father of the ghost particle? I mean, how would you ever stumble across such a thing existing? Right. Um, it was so. There's there's a lot of uh, lore, a lot of uh, stories about the um, neutrino. It was first uh, hypothesized because uh, nuclear decays were, uh, were not conserving energy, apparently. And so the only way that people could figure out to make the laws of physics work was to hypothesize some almost undetectable particle. And in, in fact, the person who did this was so embarrassed that he just sent a letter. He wouldn't actually show up at the conference to put <coughs> this, uh, this theory forward. And it took uh, several decades, in fact, before the first neutrino was detected. That was a Nobel Prize winning discovery. That were for experiments carried out in the 50s. But the theory began. The theory uh, began in the 30s. Okay. Yeah. So wh why do we why do we care how yes. neutrinos behave? Yes, um, we we care because we know that our model of fundamental physics is incomplete. <coughs> we, uh, it's it's internally inconsistent. It does not explain all of the phenomena that we uh, see in the universe. And so we hope that by better understanding neutrinos and how they relate to the other particles, we'll better understand the, the rest of the universe and how it's structured. So this is very fundamental research. Um, any payoffs from this research in terms of concrete advantages are certainly many decades uh, in the future. But if you look at all of the technology that we have around us, um, this is where everything has to start in these sort of long-term uh, investigation. So, you know, it was over a hundred years between Franklin's kite and Edison's light bulb. Uh, and so we, we hope that we're some new version of Franklin's kite here. I think that's really a very important way to think about fundamental research. Because we take for granted all of the things that we have had in our world for a very long time. And don't wind back to when those ideas began. And the kite is really, I, I think, one of the best examples of this kind of thing. You can do some others along the way. And so one of the things that, that universities now do, because of the way science and science research has evolved in the country, they're no longer the Bell Labs. You could, you could trace number, some of these kite-like work to the Bell Labs in, in the old days in terms of what we're, we're experiencing now. The reliance is more and more and more, almost solely now, on universities to do this kind of work. 
It's not in the business model of many companies. There's a push for short-term results, all the things you see around you. But the, our competitiveness as a country, the understanding of all the things around us that will be so crucial requires a set of people who remain very, very committed to being the equivalent of, of the kite. And uh, a Franklin's kite, and and that's this work. So even within the 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 the, the, the effort process, there's the university will sustain uh, a very big theory group. The same thing works if you're thinking about the way in which language gets constructed. And we heard a presentation about. Uh, uh, reading from an English professor and using now uh, uh, imaging techniques to, to think about the brain and the way it works for <laughs> applications that you wouldn't have imagined by understanding and thinking about <laughs> words as another very fundamental piece. So th that's sort of what we do and this is always at the edge. It's a balanced portfolio and you want to make sure that you identify areas that uh, have that element uh, and you can sustain it over a period of time. We've been able to do that with, with a number of aspects of physics as well as chemistry and you can go down the list. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we were doing now as you know with the new building with on the computational side is try to find both that very fundamental piece that goes with it as well as the application and in the new world try to push those things together as much as we can but in some worlds like this, the problems are so unimaginable and so difficult that it takes much, long, much longer. Steve, do you want to add anything to that? Well, these exotic particles, every time we discover a new one, at first it's just pure science, pure conceptual science. Nobody can understand what it is. We're just struggling to figure it out. But eventually, you see, we've gotten to the point now where we can actually use this to look out at the universe. So the event that he showed you, it came from somewhere. It may have come from actually another galaxy. And so eventually we'll be able to use this as a telescope. The neutrino will become something that we use to look out at the rest of the universe, the same way that we use photons right now to look out at the rest of the universe. So eventually it becomes a tool for discovery, and eventually it may even be applied. So there are already proposals to, say, build a giant uh, particle accelerator on one side of the Earth and shoot a neutrino beam through the Earth and look for oil or x-ray the center of the earth and see what the components are in the middle by shooting a, neutri a neutrino beam through. So in, in the end, it may actually turn out to be applied. But even if not, it just teaches us a lot of things about the way the universe works. But, but whatever you do with this area, you have to have people who are at really the cutting edge of their field. Uh, with, and then in science, we talked about partnerships yesterday in a variety of ways. We also have to be able to strike the partnerships uh, with facilities like Ice Cube so that people here and our students can benefit from the interaction with these students even though the experiment is in CERN if you're a high energy physicist or it's in the, uh, at the pole if you're doing this kind of work. And that's the real greatness of this place is our capacity to connect those people and have folks come here who want to be here and do that work uh, and then inter interact with our students and, and undergraduate and graduate students as opposed to doing it in an isolated sort of research laboratory someplace else. And you're, you're a very, very good teacher. You're engaged in, with, with students as a part of what you do and I thank you for that as well. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you. So there'll be a quiz later on neutrinos. <laughs>